Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Good. I want to start off, as a professor does, with a quiz for you. That's, it's, we're going to do mathematics. I'm an engineer. So if you're ready for mathematics, today I'm going to speak about big things, and I'm going to speak about change. So I'm going to take big into disruptive change, but that's why we have to start with mathematics, because that's big. It starts big. Now, maybe some of you have seen this before, but I've been doing this with students for the past 10 years, and it's always kind of interesting for them to see. So if I took a piece of paper about this big, about that thick, and I were to tear it in half, uh -oh. <laughs> and not press those buttons while I'm doing it, <laughs> I bet the music's gonna come back on again, right? <laughs> All right, so if I did that, I put the, I put the little slide advance away. So if I did that, I tore it in half, and stacked it, and tore it in half again, and stacked it and tore it in half again, and stacked it, and did that 50 times. How tall is that stack of paper? It's your test. Guess quick, quick. I'm not doing math. Anything. Dyslexic. One inch, she said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're at you're half a mile. That was a good one. Get brave. A mile brave. More brave. Uh, okay, so we'll show you really quick. I know it's so amazing to think of this. No one ever gets it right. Actually, I had one kid, one mathematical sort of bright kid that got this right, and it really gave me the answer immediately, and I was very surprised. About halfway the sun. That's just 50 tears of that piece of paper. And it's so hard to believe. And I get kids pulling out the calculator all the time. And if you want to see the math of mathematics, it's actually 2 to the 50th power. That tells you the number of tears, gives you the number of sheets. That's how many sheets there would be. <sighs> Here's the math. You don't need to really see all the mathematics because you're not mathematical people probably, or, or do you care? But it turns out to be 56 million miles high after just 50, after 50 tears. And it's always so amazing to me, amazing to students, that something that seems at least externally to be small can be so big. And so I want to tie that into something else that's happening really big. World population. Seven billion people. Over the last 50 years, five decades, we've grown by two billion people in the world. So when does the next billion come? And it depends on what projections you look at. But the proje projections tell us that about 20 to 25 years from now, we're going to have another billion people. Could be more than that, depending on how you're looking at the projection. And so what does a billion people mean? That's another big sort of number. And I started to wonder what a billion people meant, so I started doing some calculations on my calculator and pulling things out. The first, um, by the way, when we get a billion people, we're also having a billion people in that same period of time world into, move into what we call the world middle class. That's, a, that's um, people with the ability to consume. Now, not the same billion that are born, but there's a billion out there that will move into that middle class. So, so let's think what this means, this big number, and let's begin with a light bulb. So let's give all billion people one extra light bulb, no, one, one light bulb period, which is one extra that we have to create in the next 25 years. That's a point, about 0.7 ounces, but that's also about 20 million metric tons of material just to give one billion people one light bulb. But now we've got to turn that light bulb on. How are we going to turn that on? Well, we have to have power to turn that on. We need 120 500 megawatt power plants to turn that one light bulb on in the next 25 years. Now, maybe we don't want to do it with that, but if we use those, those power plants, we'll need about 1.5 million tons of coal a year to power those power plants. So let's be clean. Let's go with solar. Ah. Well, to light up those light bulbs, it will take two times the surface area of San Francisco in new solar panels just to light one light bulb with our current technology. Uh, so it's going to be kind of tough to do. We need some big area here, but we got a lot of desert, don't we? Well, so let's go with wind generation. If we took all the wind generation that, had been, that, has been, that, that was um, available in 2007, we could only keep those light bulbs um, on for about four hours a day. So point is... Big growth means big things. So I started to look at other things like vegetables. What are these people going to eat? So I went, ran out on the web and found the average number of vegetables that people eat. And I found out that we're going to need three times the surface area of California in new farmland just for fruits and vegetables in 25 years. 
using current technology, of course, and that doesn't count grains. That's just fruits and vegetables. And by the way, we need 200 billion gallons of fresh water a day for those fruits and vegetables. That's kind of a big number. And we need about 50 billion pounds more fish annually, and what we found out is that our natural fishing habitats can support no more fish production than we currently have. Where does this come from? So not long ago, a company came to ASU, Rio Tinto, which is a mining company, and we were having a conversation. We are talking about m minerals and materials, and something very interesting they said to me was, in the next decade to decade and a half, they have to remove more material from the earth than has ever been removed in the whole history of the earth from the earth. And then the next decade to decade and a half after, after that, it will happen again, and then again. And so you start to look at what a billion people and the next billion people mean in terms of impact from an energy standpoint, from a material standpoint, from, from a food standpoint, and it's that kind of number, 56 million it's, to me. It's the same sort of, sort of thing, and that's why I led with that, that example. So I want to now talk about disruptive change for me in education and my story. Um, and, I'll, and I'll bring it back to all of the people because it's this massive amount of people and the change we need um, in systems that drove me to this change. But I first want to tell you my story about change. So in 1979, April 4th, boy, that's anniversary, not long ago, I was on TWA flight 841. Any of you remember TWA? There's got to be some of you that remember TWA. Yeah. <laughs> TWA flight 841, we left from Kennedy, and it was because United was on strike, so I got stuck on a TWA aircraft. <laughs> Anyway, we're flying al along, and we get up to 34,000 feet. And I had an idea of where I was going. In fact, I knew the time I was supposed to land. You know, the pilot comes on. We will be landing in two hours and 24 minutes, or whatever they do. So we're flying along. We just had a chicken dinner where we ate with real silverware <laughs> back in those days. <laughs> it was quite good. When suddenly our airplane flipped upside down, went into a barrel roll. 89 passengers on board. This was a 727. Now, there's good news. We came back around. Now, there's bad news. We went back around again. Now, there's worse news. On the second barrel roll, we went into a spiral nosedive. Now, we're headed straight down, spinning. That's not very good, is it? So, we're at 34,000 feet. Now, we're at 30,000 feet. Now, we're at 25,000 feet. Now, we're at 20,000 feet. And somewhere close to that time, the flight recorder goes off the chart at 0.99 Mach 1. So we're going about Mach 1 at 20,000 feet, heading straight down in a spiral nosedive. I'm here, by the way. So I either jumped out of the airplane or something good happens in this story. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't jump out of the airplane, <laughs> to let you know. So, so to, to let you know just a little bit about what happened, because we don't have a lot of time, flight engineers, um, at least the FAA report, tells us that flight engineers like to extend the leading edge of the aircraft. On a wing, there's a leading edge that drops down, and it puts curvature on the wing. And that's good from an engineering standpoint when you want more lift, because curve makes lift. That's what makes planes lift. However, when you're up flying, you don't want that lift when you're up high at 34,000 feet. And so supposedly the flight engineer extended the leading edge about four inches, and there was no setting to leave it there at four inches before it dropped and gave us that curvature, but it could go out a little bit. Hit a circuit breaker on this side of the aircraft. Walked over to the other side of the aircraft, did the same, hit it, walked to the back of the aircraft. Harvey Hoot Gibson, our pilot, looks up and flips the, sees a uh, circuit breaker popped and flips it back on. So now we have one curved wing and one flat wing. That's what put us in the spin. All right, now Harvey Hoot Gibson realizes at 20,000 feet when we're heading straight down, we're in trouble, and he now recognizes that the flap needs to come up. Tries to pull that flap up. Guess what? It's not coming because the hydraulics aren't powerful enough to pull it up. So we now spin past 20,000 feet, down to 15,000 feet, when he drops the landing gear. We were coming in for landing, right? <laughs> now he did that, dropping the landing gear to create some drag on the aircraft to try to change things. As soon as he dropped it, the gates blew off. Coom. Landing gear twists. <laughs> Tail cracks. Sound effects are pretty good. <laughs> About 11,000 feet, we're still in trouble going Mach 1 or very close to Mach 1. By the way, you can look this up on YouTube. I'm not making this story up. It's real. <laughs> so at about 11,000 feet, 
something cool happens, a piece of the wing breaks off. Well, it happened to be that bent piece of the wing, so that's a good story. So all of a sudden, we have a flat wing again with a piece of the wing missing. So somewhere between three and 5,000 feet, we, we hit the bottom of our curve. Now, when you're going Mach 1, Mach 1 is 1,000 feet a second. So I was between three and five seconds before we hit the ground when, in the spin when we went zoom and then we came straight back up and the pilot didn't know where we were. He said he saw the moon in his window. The moon was straight above the aircraft. So now we're stalling. So he flips again and pulls it out and to make a long story short because I only have a minute and 42 seconds left and I haven't even told you all the other stuff. We come in for an emergency landing on a foam runway in Detroit and we all live happily ever after and we slide down the chutes. But, <laughs> That's not the end of my talk, though. <laughs> so so ju just, just to wrap a few pieces up here, the thing that was transformative, so I knew where I was going, suddenly I knew where I was going, and then I knew where I was going again, it was a very rapid change in my life. Now what happened, happens to you when you go through that is things become miraculous. Life becomes miraculous. The leaf growing on a tree becomes really green and really miraculous. And it did, and it made a, a fundamental change in my life. And if I had time, I'd tell you more about that change. But I want to quickly tell you about how that changed. I, I went into education was one, and I wanted to teach people. Actually, I wanted to be an actor also, and that one didn't work out. <laughs> so, so I got this great opportunity to travel the world looking at models. I wanted to do something different. So let's bring back that billion people that we were talking about and all the change that needs to take place. I had an opportunity to create a new program at ASU that was completely transformative. And what I tried to do is flip how students learn. So I went out, looked at models around the world. They gave me a year leave of absence to do this. I came back and built a program where instead of having students listening to lecture and being in a classroom, we build a studio-based environment where students every semester are out solving real problems, where they work with entrepreneurs, they work with companies, they work with cities, solving problems and making that an important piece of their curriculum and doing something real. Here's an example of one with the dog park in Gilbert where they took all the dog crap that was being left over in the park and built it into a digester that now lights a lamp in the city and an educational thing. So that was one of the sorts of projects that they built. I have many, many others that I could have showed you, but that's my story because I'm a zero. <laughs> Thank you very much.